Thank you for coming to the presentation today. Uh, today I have in mind to talk about uh, uh, bicentennial of this year, which is Lincoln's uh, birthday in 1809. And I thought that the uh, copper people with the, uh, all the new reverses of the uh, Lincoln scent are getting all the attention. And so we wanted to have equal attention for the uh, uh, JRCS people who collect the uh, early, silver, uh, early silver coins. And uh, so we wanted to uh, talk a little about Lincoln and uh, talk about the uh, coins of uh, 1809. Uh, just by way of, uh, of additional introduction, I'd like to mention that uh, uh, there is a club that uh, collects the, uh, uh, these coins. The JRCS is an organization uh, that uh, uh, encompasses all collectors of uh, silver and gold coins of the era. Uh, the era when coins were produced, each die was produced by hand. Um, so that generally encompasses 1794 through, uh, through uh, 1837. Um, and the bust half people have a special uh, club of interest for those that are very dedicated to the collection of uh, bust half dollars uh, from, the, uh, from 1794 to 1836. Uh, we call ourselves the Bust Half Nut Club because about all of us are pretty nuts about these coins. And in order to become a member of the Bust Half Nut Club, you uh, need to show the interest and enthusiasm for attempting to collect the entire series. Now, financially, you may not be able to collect the entire series, but the enthusiasm to try to collect all the series is what it takes uh, for, uh, for the, uh, the Bust Half Nut Club. And you have to have 100 die marriages uh, uh, to enter the club as a showing that you, for your interest. And the JRCS does not require any, any coins owned, uh, just requires an interest in that series. Uh, and so we are the ones that are interested in the silver coins uh, of that era. I will also mention to, uh, that uh, in the bust halves uh, from 1807 to 1836, I have uh, written a book called The uh, Ultimate Guide to Attributing Bust Half Dollars. Uh, and if anyone is interested in a copy uh, of this book, uh, you can see me after the presentation. Uh, this is the uh, Ultimate Guide to Attributing Bust Half Dollars. Uh, the Overton book is cumbersome. Uh, one of the uh, years, 1827, has 49 die marriages uh, and uh, would take quite a bit of time if you used the original Overton, which has no shortcuts whatsoever. My book has all the shortcuts uh, for any of those that are interested in it. Uh, see me after, after the uh, uh, presentation. Uh, so um, before I get going, are there any questions? I encourage you know, feedback and discussion. Well, the questions, because we have a big presentation to make here. OK. A very expensive item to give to Glenn. Uh, my name is Chuck Heck. I'm the treasurer of the club, and I'm so glad that you're here. I love these seminars, and I, I just can't tell you how thankful we are for people that take the time to put them together and come in to do them. It takes a lot of preparation and a lot of research, and it's just one of the best things that we can do for old-time collectors, young collectors, newbies, anybody. I think that's what our club, both clubs, EAC and JRCS, are all about. But without further ado, I, I want to get the you know, seminar going for you. But I do want to say this. Glenn, he's knocked out a couple of seminars for us already in prior years. And this year we had a last minute cancellation. I want to thank him very much because he was planning on doing this one, but he's doing another one tomorrow. He's stepping in for another guy. And, and I can see why it's not going to hurt him because the collection that this man has is absolutely incredible. I had the honor of, of, of viewing the coins and it's just mind boggling. It's amazing who you can get to meet at this. But anyway, Early American Coppers Club uh, wishes to express sincere gratitude to Glenn Peterson for graciously presenting the seminar, The Bicentennial of Abraham Lincoln as represented in the Silver Coins of 1809, as part of our educational program here at the annual convention held in Fort Mitchell, Kentucky, April 17th. Thank you very much. Glenn, thank you very, very much. And a little plug for Dave so who does all of our videos at no charge to us, doesn't cost us, pays his own way to get here, Thank you, David. You're a real prince of a man. Glenn, thank you okay. again. Okay, all right. Thank you so much. Any questions uh, before we begin about the, the series uh, of coins? Uh, 
If not, if we could uh, douse the lights, I would appreciate it. Uh, yeah, all right, thank you. And this is the uh, Lincoln Bicentennial 1809 to 2009, as represented in silver coins. Uh, a little bit about Lincoln, uh, particularly his early history. I think people are much more aware of his later history uh, when he was president, uh, but the early history escapes some people, so I thought I'd focus on that because it's getting back to the uh, bicentennial year 1809. He was born in February 12, 1809 in Hodgerville, Cardin, Kentucky, uh, Hardin County, Kentucky, lived in a one-room cabin and 348-acre farm called the Sinking Spring Farm. Uh, moved to Indiana, age eight, and then to Illinois, age 22. And uh, his first successful, uh, other history about 1809, uh, the first successful sea voyage by a steamboat, the Phoenix, hauled passengers from New York City to Philadelphia. Uh, by 1810, the population will be uh, a little bit over 7 million, with the Senate population 40 miles northwest of Washington, D.C. Uh, so you see we've expanded quite a bit west uh, since, uh, since that period of time. Now, this is the first uh, of the uh, coins. This is the 1809-101. This is uh, the rarest of the uh, year. Uh, this is the obverse of that coin and the reverse of the coin. And what I have set, a, set aside in my book is a, uh, listing a key point, which if you have that key point, then you have the uh, die marriage. Here, this is working fine until I got here. So, here we are. Okay. Key point here is underneath U, uh, the U is recut. And on the 101, the U is recut and does not have the recut uh, uh, points underneath the uh, motto, which I will show in the 102. Uh, so if you have that without the uh, uh, recut areas under the motto and without the crack in the obverse, you'll have the 101. Uh, so those are the key points of the uh, 101. Uh, this is the 1809-102. Uh, obverse and reverse. Now here you have these little little notch points that are on the 102 and most 110s uh, and never on the 101. Uh, so the 102 has these key key little notches. There's something hit the die uh, during the use of uh, uh, 18, 1809 110 and remained on the die for the remainder of its use and uh, was, did not occur in 101. Uh, so these are the key points uh, that you look for in the 110 and 102. This is 1809-103. Overton chose the 100 digits. He actually had an earlier book that had single uh, digits, uh, and then when he wrote his uh, second edition, he went, went with the 100 digits to distinguish from his original, original book. So whenever you're talking about Overton numbers, you're talking the 100 range. And this is a 103, and the reverse of the 103. And the key point on the 103 is these little lines on the uh, obverse and star uh, four, five, and six, little lines that come out of the stars. And this is on uh, 103, 104, 105, and 106. Uh, so that's a they share the common obverse die. And on the reverse, you see that M is rotated uh, with the serif above A and below E. Uh, so M is rotated on all 103s, and that's all you need for diagnosis of the uh, 103 die. Now this is an 1809-104. Uh, this is a rather <clears throat> rare die marriage, an R5. Uh, so this is one of the uh, top condition census of that particular uh, die marriage, 104 obverse and 104 reverse. And uh, in the 104 reverse, there's a little line right here inside, uh, inside the uh, uh, crossbars of the, of the shield. And that makes for the 104. Remember, it shares the reverse, shares the obverse with the 103, 104, 105, and 106. This is the 105. That's 1809-105, uh, 
and 105 reverse. Here the I is far left of the T, uh, and uh, this is the only common uh, dimarriage that that occurs. And the other key point is this little line right here, uh, left of the 5. This little line occurs in all 105s. 105 is relatively common for the 1809 coin. This is an 1809-106, a nice example of this uh, dimarriage and the 106 reverse. And the 106 reverse has an interesting mark right here. This line in the corner of the shield extends way into the wing, all the way up this far. This makes for the 106 uh, die, and uh, uh, that's not a particularly rare die for, uh, for the uh, 1809s. Here we have a recut on the N on the 106. Uh, so that's the other feature uh, for this particular uh, die marriage. Now we have here an 1809-107. That's the obverse and the reverse. And the 107, uh, this is uh, a late die state of the same coin. Here we have a crack from the uh, uh, hair all the way through between stars uh, 11 and 12. That's a late die state of the same, uh, same die marriage. And here our key point is these little marks between 50 and C. That is on the 107 and the 108. And uh, uh, the 108 has a different obverse, which I'll show in momentarily. This is a 1809-108 uh, obverse and reverse. They it's very hard to find high-grade examples of this particular coin. It has little marks through America, which you can see here. It has this mark between 50 and C, which was on the 107. And in the obverse, it has a crack through star 4 that goes well into the field. This crack here. Uh, that crack uh, begins on the, uh, on the 108s and goes to the 110s, as I'll show later. And here again is that reverse mark between the 50 and the C on the 1809-108. Uh, uh, this is an 1809-109, obverse and reverse. Here we have marks of lines through America. Uh, and we have little dots here uh, for the earliest dyed state, little dots on this uh, hair curl. Uh, that distinguish the very earliest die state. Later die state has these lines through America, uh, which are very prominent. Almost all of them do. The early die state's quite rare, and the later die states with these marks are the more common. And now we have 1809-110, uh, and uh, uh, the 110 shares the reverse die with the 101, uh, but uh, um, here, remember these marks occur partway through 110. There are a few that do not have it uh, with these marks. And uh, uh, this is the early one. It does not have the marks. This is particularly rare, the uh, 110 in the early die state without the marks. And all 110s have this line through star 4 as the 108s have. Uh, so if you have a recut U, and you have this mark, then you have a 110, whether you do, not ha whether you do or do not have the marks under the scroll. This is a, a 111, 829-111, uh, 829-111 reverse. And the key feature of the 111 is this little hatch mark here uh, above the date, uh, just below the clasp. That's on all 111s. This is an 1809-112. We're getting to another uh, rare variety. Uh, this one is an R5 and uh, very choice as such. And this is the reverse for this uh, die marriage. Uh, here you see the I is left of the T. Uh, I call it position minus three. Uh, and that usually spells something valuable and interesting except for the 105. And the key points here is there's a dot below the M. If you see right here, this dot below the M, and there also is a 
stop between the E and the D uh, on that particular variety. This is the, uh, one of the rare uh, R5 Plus, 1809-113. Uh, that's a particular choice coin to, uh, to own. And uh, um, on the reverse, uh, it has, most of them have a crack through the states of Amur. Uh, but more importantly, all have, uh, here's that crack, and uh, most, all of them have the AM joined. Uh, so that's the key point on the 113, is the AM joined. See, each of the dies were produced during this time. Each of the uh, stars, each of the, uh, each of the um, uh, letters were put in by hand. So the spacing on the letters and whether they're twisted and turned and whatnot is dependent upon each of the dies. This is an 1809-114 obverse uh, and reverse. 1809-114 has these lightning bolts, I call them, through STA and has this line connecting D and S. Uh, making it a, a nice R5 exa example of this uh, year. So this is a, 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 a particularly helpful one, and it develops a crack later on down to the eagle's neck. This is an 1809-115. We're coming to the end of the 1809 bust half dollars now. That's the 115 and the reverse. And slightly misaligned dies there, you see the coin just goes over the AM, and here the dentals are strong. And here we have little notches underneath the shield, uh, which make for the attribution of the 115, and this line occurs sometimes on the 115s. So that's the bust half dollars. Now I have a, a not so attractive example of the uh, bust dime, 1809, obverse and reverse, only one dime marriage of the bust dime. And that is all the, uh, all the coins of 1809, the bicentennial year. If you'd like to hit the lights, please. OK. Any questions about, uh, about these coins and about you know, uh, the bus coinage in general? Uh, it's not included to a great extent in my book. Uh, my book is uh, helpful in tributing the uh, coins, uh, but I don't list an awful lot of information about the die states. Um, the Herman Guide lists prices for various different die states and describes those die states. The Overton book itself uh, shows pictures of what he uh, conceived as the prime die state and A and B, or however many letters there are. And so he will show some examples of those, but there have been many since the Overton wrote his book uh, that have been discovered subsequently. Did you say Herman with the values? Uh, Stephen Herman, uh, who's the Bust Half uh, Nut Club uh, treasurer, uh, is, has written a book on the values for the Bust Half Dollars. <coughs> and he takes, uh, it's called AMBPR, Auction Mail Bid Prices Realized. Uh, and he has uh, listed the values for these coins uh, for the R4 and above uh, coins. And so if you're looking for a guide for the pricing, that's the, that's the guide uh, for the pricing. I have pricing listed in my book, uh, but it's not quite up to date uh, with the Herman guide, which continues to be revised each six months. Uh, so I have a general guide on the, on the pricing to show you the comparison of the different die marriages. I'm writing a book with uh, Brad Karloff and Rory Ray uh, and John Kovac on uh, bus quarters. Uh, and we are well along our way to concluding the, uh, the book. Um, and uh, I have a small mock-up uh, here, if you wanted to come, come by after, after my talk, uh, of how the book is, is going to look. This is the uh, obverse with uh, a 1796 uh, bust quarter. 
And uh, so we have put together some ideas about how we're going to put it all together. Uh, it will be a competitor to Steve Tompkins' book, and uh, I think ours will will have a lot of uh, very good uh, attribution guides uh, to it and uh, have some additional information uh, that uh, his may not have. Any other questions about... The difficulty of finding an 1809 dime seems to be uh, not too bad, but it still seems to be tough. To it's it's a tough, one. tough year to get. Uh, as you see, my coin's not, not any uh, great, uh, beautiful coin. Uh, so it is, it's a tougher variety to, to obtain uh, for the bust dimes. I have two. Somebody wants to come up and look at mine later on. It's a huge amount of Any other questions about attributing uh, a bust uh, silver coinage? Uh, the guides for the bust silver coinage, uh, uh, the Lug McCloskey book is the guide for uh, bust half dimes. The, uh, the Davis McCloskey uh, subject uh, Lovejoy book is the reference for the bust dimes. Uh, and the quarter of the original book is Browning. Steve Tompkins uh, beat us to the uh, publication date on the uh, revised edition, and we'll have one out soon. Uh, and then the bust halves, the standard reference is the Overton uh, and uh, the companion uh, reference for true attribution is mine um, on the uh, bust halves. Could you comment on uh, your approach in your book is very different than the Overton approach. Yes. Um, you refer to it as kind of the quick find. Mm -hmm. um, but I noticed um, a lot of the points that you cover Overman doesn't, and a lot that Overman covers you don't. Yes. Uh, so. Well, the the approach to Overton was to you know have the the standard reference to uh, the uh, die marriages and have a, a high quality picture of the obverse and reverse. At the time, the Bust Half Nut Club was a closed organization, which has changed since I've led the organization. Uh, and they didn't really want to give out secrets to attributing the coins or the rarity involved or the value involved uh, of any of these coins because they wanted to have it just to themselves. Uh, but we have changed our philosophy. Now we're into education and passing on information and encouraging the collection of these coins. We're just a totally different organization. So it was a very deliberate uh, process to not give any quick finders or easy finders in the original reference. Uh, that was not the uh, the intention was to give out the standard reference, and uh, so he has a description using star points and all those things. Uh, when I was uh, originally looking at the uh, coins, I had the uh, fortune to visit uh, uh, John Powers, uh, who is among us today, and uh, uh, I was using all the reference from Overton, the star points, the upper edge of the dental, and such, and John had uh, accumulated. Uh, uh, bust halves from uh, the 1950s. He had put an advertisement in the 1950s, and uh, he told me that he had uh, uh, well over 1,200 uh, bust halves. And I said, "Really?" And he <laughs> came to his house, and uh, I was amazed when I got there uh, to visit him. He was very kind to have me over to his house. He picked up this giant bag, dumped it on the table, and. There was a, uh, a horde of bust halves uh, from uh, uh, 1807 to 1836. My number, right? And uh, with no numbers. And uh, uh, the challenge was to be able to attribute these coins. Now, his coins were generally, you know, whatever was sent to him, and they were generally good, very good coins, some of AGs and such. There's no dentals. There's no, <laughs> no dentals on these coins. There's nothing you can use. And so my challenge was to find something in the interior of the design that would be helpful to attribute these coins and what I call a key point. Key point is something that is on one die and on no, no, no other dies of that year. Uh, so that's a key point. If you have that, you have the die. If you don't have it, you don't. And uh, it has to start at the beginning of the die and finish at the end. Sometimes I found key points that were lapped off. Sometimes I found points that developed 
I mentioned there's little marks under the motto here. They developed later in the die, so that wouldn't be a key point for attributing the, uh, the coins. And I had to find a key point throughout the use of the die. So I made the key points and focused on those in my book so you can have rapid attribution. I wasn't making an effort to be the standard reference or, uh, or uh, uh, list a lot of information about die states. So because a lot of people would say, bust heads, you know, I don't mess with that, and you know, 49 dollars varieties and 27, I'm not going to spend my time messing with that. That takes all day. And uh, so now with this book, it takes a minute instead of uh, an hour or something uh, to do it. And Ken, your, your internal stand for, standard for how many dies do you need to look at before you're absolutely convinced? Well, uh, just what I did, uh, I viewed, went to all my good friends uh, in the Bostaff Nut Club who had the most complete collections, uh, all of which had over 400 of the 450 die marriages, and visited uh, uh, 19 of my friends and had, uh, uh, I believe I, I listed uh, 9,700 coins to view. And sometimes my key point was lapped off the die, it no longer became a key point, and sometimes it wasn't in the early die states, and so I revised it until I could find one that, uh, that uh, uh, lasted throughout the die. And interestingly, in my first edition, I had uh, all the pictures correct with the exception of the 1822-109. Uh, there I had a chip in the end that existed on other, other die marriages and sometimes didn't exist on that one. Totally worthless point. So I had to revise one out of 729 pictures. So that wasn't, wasn't a bad record uh, to uh, get most of the information correct. And so my second edition has one, one correction in it. When does the Bus Path Nut Club meet in a where? Okay, we have meetings uh, at A&A, &A, uh, and uh, we have meetings at the Fun Show uh, regularly. And we have uh, periodic meetings uh, uh, that uh, members will give in some local shows. I'm giving a meeting of the Bus Taft Nut Club in Dalton uh, in August of this year, and we're going to meet there. We had one in Hickory, North Carolina uh, last September. Uh, so we have some in the local shows if a member is so inspired. Uh, but the, the main meetings are uh, uh, the Fun Show and the a and wherever that would be located. And we always have an open meeting and an educational meeting. This year in uh, Los Angeles, uh, Brad Higgins has volunteered to give a talk on cuds on uh, bus tabs, primarily 1805, uh, and give his definition of the cut because there's lots of ideas. What exactly is a die break and what is a cut and uh, when do you find that versus a chip in the die and such. And he's going to try to you know, answer some of those questions uh, in the presentation of the Bus Tab Nut Club Thursday afternoon, I think 3 o'clock. Uh, in uh, in Los Angeles. Is that in conjunction with an A&A &A meeting? In conjunction with the A&A uh, &A annual meeting, yes. And then we have our uh, uh, members only that morning, but the afternoon is welcome for everybody. And so we're, we're really out to get information out to people and, and share information. And uh, the result is our club has grown by leaps and bounds. We have uh, 100, uh, I think it's 105 members now uh, and continue to grow uh, rapidly, uh, all the time. Any plans for updates on the half dime design? Well, the half dime book has been written as excellent as a start. We have a presentation of the JR, JRCS meeting on Wednesday at the ANA in uh, Los Angeles, and uh, uh, Richard Mean and I are going to be talking about uh, revisions of some of the uh, uh, of the remarriages. Uh, for bust half uh, half dimes, uh, there is one um, one marriage uh, with a reverse of 1829 LM 13.1, uh, 13.2, and 30 LM 1.1, 1.2 that we think has to be completely changed, and we believe that uh, um, that uh, uh, the current thinking we have is uh, that the description in Logan is incorrect for the 31.1. And the uh, 29s may not be a remarriage after all, maybe just 29, 13. Uh, but we're still trying to find the one that Logan described that are, no one's been able to produce convincingly. 
uh, as per the book. And there is a revision in the 18, uh, 1832 LM 10 and 11, uh, which I'll be talking about in, uh, uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, and I uh, showed that, you know, those changes last night, the happenings, uh, showed those changes that uh, are from the text. Uh, so there are the cracks that occur sooner. I thought I might have a new remarriage, and it turns out the, the text was just, didn't include some of the cracks that uh, should have been included. And so I do not have a remarriage, I just have a new die state. And so we have revised a fair number of the points, but Generally, the book is starting to started out as a superb reference, and has very few uh, corrections to be made. The bust dime book uh, is much older, uh, and much more has been discovered on the new late die states of the uh, bust dimes. No, no new die marriages have been found, uh, but uh, uh, there's new die states uh, and new cuds for the bust dimes. And we're having a presentation tomorrow on the bus dime cuds with uh, Brad Karloff and I'm contributing uh, and uh, there's a whole series of new ones for that and there's a new dime marriage of the bust half dimes 1835 LM12 uh, that was discovered since the book so that that is a new new coin that's been discovered uh, since the uh, publication and the bus quarter book the uh, Browning is very hard to use, he will say, this one has the stars further than that one. But if you don't have that one, how can you do it? So it's, it was in great need of revision, and Steve Tompkins did his, uh, did his job on it. We're going to do our job on it. And hopefully we'll have some very good references on that. Um, in order to become a member of the Bust Half Nut Club, I know you have to prove you have identified 100 different die marriages. And so what yeah. is the best way of presenting that? Uh, to meet with a member uh, and have the get the coins there? Or yeah. Or uh, works? Well, probably look over the coins and check your uh, grading skills and your uh, and get to know the member and see if you have the enthusiasm to the collection of the series. And then the member would introduce you to the club and if everyone accepts then you become a member. Okay. Uh, so if you have that enthusiasm, <laughs> seek, seek <laughs> one of us out. We have, we have uh, two members of the club. Uh, uh, Ken Ingram is also a member of the club, uh, present uh, uh, for this meeting. I'm trying to be. <laughs> you're, you're interested? I'm, I'm on my way. Okay, oh, good. What, what town do you live in? I have about 50 nine marriages right yeah. now. What town do you live in? Uh, Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Wisconsin. We have some folks up that way. I think Chicago, it's, it's uh, maybe the closest we have. I'm not sure. But uh, get to know some of the members uh, close by and yeah. visit them. It'll be a while. And, uh, we would be uh, delighted to welcome you into their, our midst, as we have been with uh, so many other new members. Well, uh, that is the third edition of your book? That's the third edition of the book. Although what, is it's, the, what it's, were the re revisions you made? Actually, the revisions between the first and second edition. This is just a reprinting, actually, of the second edition. Okay. But they called it the third edition in the, uh, uh, when they printed it. Did you update uh, values or anything? No, I have not yet. Uh, I may have to do that. Uh, well, I guess it will become a fourth edition. Okay. Uh, so next time I'll have to update it because these values are several years old. Any other questions? Yes. Um, <coughs> I'm not familiar with bus halves, but the values are for the Overton numbers, for each Overton number? Yes, I have values listed here for the Overton numbers, uh, uh, and particularly the rare ones. Okay, um, so my next question then leads into the, have you thought of doing that for the bus quarters at all? Uh, we're, we're not including values. We are including a condition census. Uh, values would be And nice we're including stuff. die That's states. Tough job. Yeah, die states and condition census. The values and quarters have been changing so rapidly, we would date our book seriously if we did that. Yeah. Uh, more more rapidly than the bust halves, uh, and so uh, we have not decided to put any values in. But we have just recently, uh, Rory Ray has accumulated substantial information on the censuses of each coin, uh, and uh, uh, he has. Uh, 
extensive information and photos of each of the R4s and above, and uh, so our condition census should be very accurate. Okay. Uh, that'll be included in the book. It's just like EAC has the CQR, and you know, the, the half dollars have your values. And I know what you're saying, though, the prices are going up so fast that it yeah. doesn't be accurate past a few months, but it would be nice to try to do that. Well, yeah, hard your, endeavor too, though. it will be hard endeavor for sure. Okay. And uh, other questions about uh, the silver collections? <coughs> I invite you to uh, uh, join us uh, for our presentations 11 and 12 uh, tomorrow and uh, hear about the CUDs on the smaller silver denominations. Thank you very much. If you're interested in the book, come back.